what I'm looking to achieve with this other than putting on one of the greatest, most unique sporting events of all time and probably the greatest combat sporting event of all time. When this guy gets an opportunity to fight Sean Mello Chino Vera, it's going to be easy work from time. He's something special and he's got the potential to go down as the greatest bantamweight the sport has ever seen. Here all we know is bust it up. I got some dirty spiders so we're filling up my cup. My shooters come in clutch. You know you get in touch. UFC 305 was one of the best events of the year to date. We had Dreykus Duplessis solidifying himself as the best middleweight in the world. Kaikara France shook the arena by knocking out Steve Ersig in the first round. And Dan Hooker showed off that he's a psychopath in a big win against Mateus Gamble. But now we come to one of the most hyped UFC events this year, and that's UFC 306 inside the Sphere. The Sphere has been the most talked about venue this whole fight, being mentioned many times by Dana White in the UFC. On this card, we got Sugar Sean O'Malley headlining and defending his Bantamweight belt against the toughest fighter in his division, Marab Devadashvili. Then, in the co-main event, we got a trilogy with the women's flyweight champ Alexa Grasso going against one of the best women fighters of all time in Valentina Shevchenko. And lastly, we got top featherweights facing off as Brian Ortega is looking to get back into the title picture against top prospect Diego Lopez. Here in this video, I'll go over the main fighters facing off in the main card and determine what fighters will come out on top this weekend in Las Vegas. Starting this video off, we got former title challenger Brian Ortega versus Diego Lopez. These guys were supposed to face off at UFC 303, and everything looked good coming into fight week. All of a sudden, Brian Ortega starts to look visibly tired and exhausted Thursday at the press conference, a little more than usual. Then we get news on Friday morning that Ortega was unable to cut the weight to 145 and pleads with Lopez in the UFC to make the fight happen at 150, which they oblige. Lopez and Ortega face off Friday afternoon, and Lopez is looking forward to paving his path against the top ranked guy. Unfortunately, this sickness that Ortega had that forced him to stop cutting weight was not only a weight cut problem, but on the day of the fight, Ortega is unable to fight and is forced to pull out. Try to weigh in, try to feel good, but just I, just, I just wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah, even even the day of the fight, I don't know if uh, you ever been sick before, where it's, it's not to where like you're too like boohoo but you're just you don't have energy to leave the bed mm -hmm. like just to go to the restroom is uh it's like uh, yeah that's what it was diego lopez ends up going against den ige at a catch weight of 165 pounds a whole 20 pounds above what the bout was originally scheduled at lopez did what he was supposed to do and den ige was praised for stepping in on hours notice but we still have some unfinished business between these two Diego Lopez is an all-around kind of fighter, mixing his striking and grappling very well. He's had four wins in the UFC, with two of them being by knockout and one being by submission. But what sets him apart from these other fighters is the amount of pressure Lopez puts on his opponents. As soon as the opening bell rings, Lopez is on his opponent, making sure he doesn't have any space to breathe. However, his skills aren't top tier skills when you look at them individually. His striking is sloppy at times, and his ground game has some holes in it. But he's a true fighter, so you can never count Lopez out of a fight. But he's going against one of the best featherweights in the world in Brian Ortega. T-City is a nightmare matchup for every featherweight in the UFC. His unique grappling skill in a division where the top 5 are striking heavy fighters, Ortega is a headache for these other guys. Not only is his grappling great, his striking isn't bad either, keeping up with the best of them on the feet. He stood toe to toe with guys like Max Holloway, Yair Rodriguez, and Frankie Edgar, the latter of which Ortega knocked out. The way this fight plays out, Lopez will try to put the pressure on Ortega in order to not let Ortega get into a rhythm, while T-City will try to shoot and work on the ground. I don't see a way for Brian Ortega to win this fight, so I got Lopez by decision. The next fight I'll go over that's happening this weekend is one of two championship fights and the co-main event. We got the current women's flyweight champ Alexa Grasso going against one of the best women fighters to ever exist and Valentina Shevchenko for the third straight time. The champ Alexa Grasso won the belt off Shevchenko in a devastating upset, winning the fight by submission in the fourth round. They then had a rematch at the first Noche UFC, where the opposite of their first fight happened. Grasso won the fight on the feet, 
landing over 60 more strikes, but Valentina won the fight on the ground, securing 4 of 7 takedowns. The fight ended in a draw, leaving Grasso as the champ. This happened almost a year ago to the day of their next match, and a lot of buildup has happened since then. We've seen these two coach against each other in the Ultimate Fighter, a show created by the UFC for upcoming talent. Now that the history of this matchup is explained, let's get into what these fighters can do. Starting with the challenger, Valentina Shevchenko was already one of the greatest women fighters of all time before she lost the belt. She's faced and beat the who's who of women's MMA, beating Juliana Pena, Joanna Young Jacek, Jessica Andrade, and debatably beating Amanda Nunes in one of two matches. Her style is arguably the best defense we've ever seen from a fighter, men's or women's division. She only absorbs an average of two significant strikes a minute, using great octagon movement to her advantage. Shevchenko likes to keep the fight standing, but won't be opposed to taking the fight to the ground, showing her groundwork and her last fight. But she's going against arguably her toughest test in the UFC, and Alexa Grasso. Grasso took the UFC world by storm when she upset Shevchenko to win the Women's Flyweight Championship. Being one of three Mexican UFC champions, Grasso fights with this relentless pressure that her opponents struggle against. That's the reason why Grasso won these fights against who seemed to be unbeatable in the women's flyweight division. Grasso does take a lot of strikes, but she gives those strikes right back in 10 seconds, absorbing one strike to land two or three of her own. The way this fight plays out, it'll play out exactly like the second fight. Shevchenko will try to take this fight to the ground, but this time Grasso will be more prepared for that and stuff those takedowns. I think it's time for Shevchenko to finally release the crown, and Grasso will do enough to win this fight by decision. Lastly, we come to the fight that everybody is here to see. UFC Bantamweight champ Sugar Sean O'Malley is looking to defend his belt for the second time against the top ranked Bantamweight and Marab Dvalishvili. How this fight came to be took way too long by the UFC. Before O'Malley was the champ, the UFC wanted to give Marab the title shot against Aljamain Sterling. But because of their close relationship, Marab denied the fight many times, missing his chance to be champ. This caused Dana White to be upset with Marab, saying things like this about him. So, does Marab want a shot at the title, or would Marab rather have people under him jump over him, and him have to take on all these different, different tough guys when he's not even getting a title shot when he's next in line for it? That's a personal decision that he needs to make if that's what he wants to do. I can tell you how that story ends. It's not, it's not a good ending to that story, but he's a big boy. He can figure that out on his own. Our guys are so dumb, it's, it's next level unbelievable. It Instead, Sean O'Malley got his shot at the belt and took it away from Marab's best friend. Then UFC fans called for Marab to get the next title shot against O'Malley since Aljo wasn't the champ anymore. But because Marab denied so many title opportunities, and the UFC wanted to make money off Sean's only loss in the UFC, they booked the rematch of the 6 ranked Bantamweight Marlon Chido Vera against the champ O'Malley. O'Malley whooped him for 5 straight rounds, proving that Chido didn't deserve that title shot. But this opened the path to where we at now. This beef has been brewing since O'Malley wanted to use Marab as a coat rack in his face off against Aljamain's thrill. Marab took the coat, put it on, and flexed all around the octagon with it on. From then, there was a constant back and forth on social media, both fighters clowning each other for the past few months. Going away from the activities outside the cage, let's get into what both fighters can do inside of it. Marab Dvalishvili has been a guaranteed loss for his opponents when he's faced against them, and there's one sole reason for that, his cardio. This guy is constantly moving forward and looking to drain his opponents with never before seen takes. He makes all world UFC talents look miserable in the octagon. Former champs like Henry Cejudo, Piotr Jan, and Jose Aldo got dog walked by Marab, each of the fighters looking exhausted after the fight. His striking is pretty bad to be honest, but that's not his game anyway. He'll look to grab a hold of Sean O'Malley as soon as the fight starts. Now going to the champ, Sean O'Malley is the exact opposite fight style. I've said it before and I'll say it again. O'Malley is the best striker in the UFC, and he's the best striker by far too. His precision, his timing, his speed, his movement, his shot selection, literally everything about O'Malley's striking is damn near perfect. He's knocked out 12 of his 18 wins, and he's looking to do the same this weekend. 
MMA purists across the world have called this a bad matchup for Omaut, but I think it's the exact opposite. You give him a guy who can't strike at a high level and depends on his cardio to win the fight. The way the fight plays out, I think O'Malley uses the octagon very well to evade Marab's takedowns and knocks him out early. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. All that being said, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe and I'll talk to you guys later.